Oh, I pressed it. We are live. <laughs> cool. I looked very stunned then. <laughs> right, let's find us. Do, 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 do. We are live. Happening now. We are live. Oh. Oh, hi, Chloe from the past. Yeah, quiet, Chloe from the past. Okay. Right. Currently, I don't think, I think we've got one person here currently, unless that's you. Two. It's me and you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, here we go. We've got some more. Here they come. Yay. Incoming. Incoming Ortiz. Okay. La, 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 la. Yeah, we do. We, we, we could do with a, um, an intro song. Just order some like um, elevator music, lift music. Like Sims music. Roberta Bonzel? Bonzel? Bonzel, I say. Roberta. We're just going to chill, obviously, like we usually do until there's a small number of us in here. Why can I not remember the song now? The song. The song. Which one? Our normal song. Scoop up the Ortiz. Yeah. Scoop up the Ortiz now and bring him to Academy. Scoop up the Ortiz now, they'll be happy as can be. Bring him along. Why, they won't mind. They want to be with their own kind. Scoop up the Ortiz now and bring him to Kanta. I bring him to, I mean, Okada. I bring him to Okada. I bring him to Okada. Well, that, that song didn't used to have Okadri on the end. Oh, that was a nice suspended stim. <laughs> right, okay. 18 people. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Kirsty Ashforth. Cool. Uh, Victoria mm -hmm. just says no. I'm not sure why. Um, Zoe hopes we're both well. We, I think we're getting there. We're all right, aren't we? Yeah, Simon yeah. is all aboard. All aboard the Alti Express. Oh, I really need, yeah. What do we need? Is it a need or a want? Um, I'm not sure. Probably a need, to be honest. Okay, well, there's 20 of us, 20 of us now. Okay, well, that'll do, won't it? I think so. We'll start for you, lovely lot. And it will go it will go up significantly after. Oh, there's Jess. Hey Jess. Jess. Oh, Jess, right on time. Cue Jess Cool. Oh, Jess, I was hoping you'd turn up. <laughs> cool, Jess, cool. Yeah. So, everyone, welcome. Oh no, sorry, it was no to elevator music. Okay, fair enough. And I realized I wasn't doing uh, the stim. Uh, the, the sim not the stim Ugh, what are they called the sims i wasn't doing the sims theme tune i was doing the wii theme tune i can nice. only remember what the sims post woman or paper woman paper boy paper girl paper person okay we do we do have a topic um Done. yeah so today um harry it's quite an interesting one today. So we're doing um, basically about boundaries and how to create them and why we need them, how to be aware of them, because actually I'm very poor at understanding my own boundaries and where to put them in place and how to maintain them and basically respect yourself with boundaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be especially difficult if you are boundary blind, for want of a better expression. And I often talk about boundaries in my presentations, how sometimes the PDA person may even need to break a couple of boundaries if they are to understand why the boundary is there in the first place, which could lead to problems. Um, and ideally, we wouldn't be in that situation. It would be more clear. Also acknowledging how boundaries differ across neurotypes. 
you could be described as a person who doesn't have any boundaries when in reality, no, you do, but they just uh, appear uh, at different times because of different things. So, yes. So Shall I to... proceed with the sharing? Yeah, I was just going to quickly, so potential trigger warnings. We oh. we haven't rehearsed this session or anything like that, um, but we just want to in case certain things might come up. So just in case we may be mentioning potential um, grooming, there may be discussion of non-consensual sexual experiences and possibly things like molestation, but we will not be going into details. We will only be sort of using them perhaps as examples, or we might not bring them up at all. Um, and importantly, I don't know how to explain how we came about to be doing it this way. Can you? explain how we're doing what we're doing i have no idea how we got there here well uh, well initially um i know of an autistic counselor mm -hmm. and they were discussing boundaries and i was kind of like that's actually something i really need to understand better myself and then actually be able to help other autistic people as well um because i noticed that within our community we really struggle with boundaries and keeping ourselves safe mentally physically all this kind of thing so this autistic counselor is very very much aware about boundaries and, and knows how to teach about it and so they decided to in like a private session teach me and harry the information to then go on to teach you guys on academy so harry is going to because i still am quite um Mm, I'm still not too sure. Neither am I, if I'm honest. But so we're going to work through it, and um, eventually, the, the particular autistic counsellor is going to support us in other um, sort of subtopics relating to boundaries, because yeah. I think this is going to be a really big. It's something we discovered topic. when we were discussing it. Um, wow, it is quite a broad topic. Um, many areas need to be tackled, and through understanding. Um, boundaries of each individual neurotype hmm. it could perhaps change our understanding of boundaries entirely where one person's boundary could be another person's idea of uncooperativeness uh, so it's about bridging those gaps and yeah so without further ado where are we we're over here new presentation is it visible because i'm I gonna see it yes I'm not going to be able to see anyone in a minute. There we are. <laughs> okay, so welcome everyone to Academy in Discussion. Uh, today we will be discussing boundaries, as we've already said. I'm Harry Thompson, and I'm joined by Dr. Potato. <laughs> nice. Okay, intro. Why we're covering this, which we've kind of already done, I suppose, right? I think so yeah there we are you could mention about yeah so it might be nice to do like say when we were having this conversation and it was a, it's a fantastic conversation with this autistic yeah. counselor um they were saying how there are so many types of subtopics on boundaries that we won't be able to cover um so like you said harry there's perhaps differences in understanding boundaries and maintaining them for yourself when your pda versus just autistic for instance um, the importance of boundaries in childhood is really important. Will there be differences? Absolutely. In, like you said, neurotypes. So if you're neurotypical versus neurodivergent, the boundaries will be different. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll probably expand on these in greater detail in the future. Um, we were thinking about examples surrounding, you know, boundaries in childhood, for example. Um, perhaps uh, traditionally speaking, parents would not have allowed for their children to have as much privacy, um, perhaps um, not recognizing uh, the sanctity of their own space and maybe just inviting themselves in their child's room at the end of the day. I'm the parent, uh, you're the child, and uh, I determine uh, those kinds of boundaries, not you. And um, you, could, you could apply that way of thinking and being to an autistic child and end up potentially traumatizing them for life. Uh, because um, 
it's an invasion. If you're an autistic child who identifies strongly with uh, your personal domain and the orderliness of your surroundings and a foreign entity um, encroaches this space, it's like violation of the soul. So this is where um, uh, we have an example of boundaries uh, within different neurotypes. And obviously we've spoken about PDA sometimes um, feeling as though, okay, my perception of boundaries is that um, in order to learn from a situation, perhaps breaking one or two boundaries will enable, will give me the direct experience of, ah, oh, that's why we do X, Y, Z. That's why we respect X, Y, Z. That's why we, um, uh, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, uh, anyway, but we discovered in our conversation that, wow, this is such an incredibly vast and nuanced topic and we can't possibly cover everything in one session. However, we can, uh, we can tackle the basics, I think. Oh, come on. So what is a boundary? Uh, some obvious physical examples would be that of walls and fortresses and fences, for example. Um, garden fences separating your garden from other people's. It's obvious this is my space. Um, uh, I need there to be a distinct marker uh, separating my space from your space. And then we, we are clear as to what I'm allowed to touch um, freely and what I am not to touch or what I would require permission to touch. Um, so yeah, boundaries might keep something in. It might uh, stop something from coming in. It might keep something out and it might be protecting something. So we can think about very um, uh, obvious physical non-human examples. It might keep something in. So. I mean, it would, that would be the same as the fourth point, I suppose. You could be protecting something or there could be something that you need to keep in because it might pose a significant risk to the outside world. And we could draw parallels. Um, perhaps there is something within you, the inner Loki, if you're a pda -er, um, which you might need to harness, which you might need to channel, which you might need to be careful of. And putting yourself in a, a dodgy environment could bring out um, the extremity of your character that could lead you into problems. Uh, it might stop something from coming in. So we can immediately think about um, the child or adult who is autistic who masks. Um, in doing so, they are fending off unwanted external outside elements. So, yes. And, and I think in relation to these, it's quite interesting because when I have been trying to look into boundaries so this is something before we spoke to the counsellor that I was already trying to look into I'd looked into yeah. it with Annette and it was interesting because I get the idea of boundary and and obviously they've got the examples of a brick wall and a fence and things like that and I think that that can be problematic because it gives this idea that you're completely shutting things off Mm -hmm. which you and could be but it wouldn't necessarily always be the case I guess yeah so it's quite it is quite interesting yeah um and what is a Chloe well that's I mean th that's the um that's the big question of the day you know I think it's easier to define a boundary than it is a Chloe <laughs> so maybe I can um maybe you guys can help me you know I want to know what a Chloe is I, I know don't roughly. Know you added that point, like it did amuse me. Because <laughs> it's the first thing that popped into my head. So when I was, when I put number one, what is a boundary, immediately my head said, what is a Chloe? So I'll ignore it. Keep going. Can you imagine a brick? What is a Chloe? No, it, it will go away. It might keep <laughs> it, what is a Chloe? And it wouldn't go away. So I just said, okay, well, clearly that's um, the universe's way of saying uh, this is totally relevant to, this, to, to, to today's discussion. Right. Um, oh, I need to move the, the zoom bar because it's getting in the way. Sometimes, it is sometimes called a boundary. Dictionary definition. People can have boundaries too, but they are usually invisible unless you are wearing a suit of armour. Uh, my mask was an invisible boundary, Dr. Potato on her mask, um, which we kind of discussed earlier. And that's, that's it really. That's your way of saying 
it's it's your true autistic essence's way of saying i cannot withstand the intensity of the nt world you are not to venture outside without a suit of armor and because of only learning about my mask in that this way in term, not in terms of boundaries per se but in terms of even the fact that i was wearing one or had one um only since being diagnosed and sort of looking into it and things i can really understand now what that was doing and it was it was putting without knowing it a face a front that meant stay away don't don't approach me don't you know um put me in a, a position where I'll be uncomfortable and things like that so mm. like I say this has been such an Im important thing for me to have this discussion with this counsellor about because now I'm looking at the mask in that way as well like it was a protective thing and you've discussed this before haven't you multiple times which is about the importance of the mask that it's both a good thing and a bad thing because it does protect you to a large extent but it also means that you can lose your sense of self in the process. Yeah. And um, uh, through explaining what the mask is and what we need to do with it can often confuse people because on one hand I'm saying, it's not good if the child is masking because they are uh, not comfortable with being themselves. They're clearly having some kind of identity battle. But then in the same breath, I say, but you are not to teach them to unmask. They have to. You know, so it seems um, contradictory, but the point is that, well, it's not ideal, but unfortunately it is a necessity based on the incongruence between myself and the environment. But again, I think, obviously we will probably talk about this a lot through this session, but we've talked about it, haven't we? That boundaries are like, it's self-respect and- Sorry, sorry, sorry. It's self-respect and it's autonomy to have boundaries it's it's to protect yourself and so that does make sense what you're saying which is why you shouldn't be the one imposing the removal of a mask from an autistic person on them because then you're encroaching on their boundaries their personal autonomy absolutely i kind of um use that i use the example in my presentations of how so often a child who presents with behaviors that are destructive to the status quo are described as not having any boundaries. But if we think about it from their perspective, there's actually just as many boundaries in many cases. If that is their way of saying, um, I cannot enter your world in a calm manner. This, um, the child who cannot bring themselves to go into school has put a boundary in place. They have uh, deemed school unsafe and therefore they aren't going into school. And from an outsider's perspective, it could may as well appear that that child is naughty and um, disobedient, but no, it's got nothing to do with that whatsoever. They are merely um, putting a very important boundary in place that keeps them safe from school. And I think I really hope that I never I, I it's very likely that I will um, misconstrue or in terms of re restating what we were taught by this counsellor. But the most important thing for me was to understand that the boundaries really are just about you. They are not about other people. They are about you being safe and protected mm. um, and this kind of thing. So that is interesting, like you say, that for some who are, are arguably in quotation marks school refusers then school intolerant yeah and then 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 being told that well they have no boundaries and like you said actually they do because the boundaries aren't about them or about the school or about learning per se it's about that individual mm. they've made a statement about how and yeah. it, how they actually or, want to live you know or you could consider the child who is perhaps, um, quote, acting out, unquote. And at that point, they may be described as not having any boundaries. They're, they're violating boundaries left, right and center with their acting out. It's like, well, perhaps they're acting out because they themselves feel as though their boundaries were violated, which gave rise to this acting out. So it's very important to understand um, 
the relationship um, between the relationship between one neurotype's boundaries and the other. Uh, anyway, saying yes. Have you ever said yes to something you didn't really want to say yes to? Uh, for example, saying yes to going on a shopping trip or the pub, a concert, nightclub, gym when you didn't really want to, or saying yes to helping a someone, a someone, <laughs> I like that, helping a someone with a task, an essay shopping, decorating, moving house, when you didn't have time or didn't really want to. Or perhaps you said yes because uh, you said you could meet a deadline for a work task or essay when you knew you would find this too difficult. Or you said yes to food or a drink that you either didn't want or didn't really like. Or given someone your things or money that you didn't want to give. Uh, or, or you had been intimate or had sex with someone you didn't really want to but went along with it anyway. And then, yeah, we could ask, why did you say yes? Perhaps it's because you felt under pressure, uh, because you didn't feel like you could say no, and uh, you didn't know whether you wanted to say yes or no, and you didn't have enough time to decide what you wanted, or quite simply, because you wanted them to like you. So if your answer was yes to any of these, then perhaps your boundaries might be a little flimsy. Uh, so, <sighs> It's very difficult because the, what I would dis, was describing the other day when the counselor was speaking to us was a kind of very uh, strange and painful process in which you kind of violate your own boundaries. So I was describing how you can have natural boundaries in place, but you it's up to you to build upon them. So the fact that you've said yes to something you don't actually want to do implies that one part of you was prepared to put a boundary in place. The, the sheer fact you didn't want to or you were anxious to means that you have a rudimentary boundary inside of you, but you chose to go against it because the consequences or the costs would be too great. I would much rather say yes when I really want to say no, because if I say no, and I'm rejected by uh, this peer group, then I will feel alone and abandoned and terrible. So you're always trying to minimize the damage. Saying yes and going against your nature may um, minimize the damage short term in many um, circumstances. So we find that we often violate our own boundaries um, in favor of gaining acceptance from people. And, and these, some of these really, obviously, again, we won't in, go into lots of detail, but are very worrying for very vulnerable autistic people. Like I, I have heard people talking, autistic people talking about not understanding sort of the social rules of Tinder and going on dates and things like that. Mm. And and it's about this is why I wanted to do this for numerous reasons to be able to be able to put in boundaries for myself to keep myself safe yeah. in all ways, like I say, physically, psychologically, but so I can actually teach other autistic people too. Yeah. And particularly where it comes to things like that, because how many people have gone on dates and perhaps, you know, gone further in that date in terms of intimacy than they were actually were comfortable with because yeah. they think that's what you do, that that's the norm, that that's the social norm. You know, on a first date, you do have a kiss at the end of the night and actually that isn't what you want and you feel uncomfortable, but you're kind of like, but that's all the films say that. And I know my friends do that. And it's, and somebody made a really good point. And um, it was, obviously this is all about saying yes, um, but Victoria states you didn't know you could say no and that is so such a huge thing that we can say no and we just feel that we can't because of all these different it, it, reasons. I think it's an in, I think it's an interesting example of growing up autistic um, surrounded by people who are not autistic themselves you probably notice that your natural inclination is actually to say no most of the time because the majority of the activities your peer group wants to do does not naturally appeal to you so that kind of um, cements this self-negation process very early on um, if you're not totally comfortable with yourself um, in spite of everyone else finding you weird 
all power to you, but you may realize very early on that, okay, I am a little different and people want to do things that I often don't want to do and I don't want to miss out. So you feel trapped by, you feel, you feel trapped by meeting everyone else's needs. And it really cements that fawning process, uh, for, that fawning response. Oh, let's have a look. Right, apologize if the writing's a little small. You know, we had a lot of points that we wanted to, to make. So number three, why might your boundaries be flimsy? You may have wonky or flimsy boundaries or no boundaries at all because you did not have any boundaries during your childhood, have not been taught how to have boundaries. You have low self-esteem, you have been bullied, you want to fit in, you're scared to say no, you're worried about upsetting others, you don't like letting others down, you always want to help, you do not know or understand what you want, you prefer to be told what to do. You want to feel rejected. You don't want to feel rejected next time. You are a people pleaser. Many of these I'm aware we've spoken about, but it's important, it's important to go through them anyway again. You don't want to appear grumpy or aggressive or uncooperative. You just want a quiet life because you're a fauna. A balance of respect, autonomy and safety, awareness and honesty, for example, manipulation. Um, oh, so this is what you need. Now, I made a point because very often you may put a boundary in place and perhaps the universal reaction or the universal accusation made by the people you are letting down would be that you are selfish, that you're only thinking about yourself. But I've got news for you. Boundaries are not a form of selfishness. They're actually a form of self-love. And if we return to the previous example on the other page, um, when we say yes to things that we don't really want to do, when we agree to things we know aren't right for us, we negate ourselves first. We violate our own naturally inbuilt boundaries first. So we're not actually being selfless when we say yes to things that are bad for us. Um, we're actually being self-negating. And similarly, when you draw a boundary, it's not that you're being selfish. It has nothing to do with that. You are being self-loving. And it's very important to know that. I don't even know what to add. It, this, like I say, this has been such a huge thing to have sat through and to understand um, all of these things. And I think it does make sense because I think if I think about other people who will say, if I ask them for something and they'll say, no, I, I don't want to do that thing, or no, I can't do that thing. I can't think of, of occasions where that's made me dislike that person or where that's made me feel that they've let me down or something like that. So I do think it becomes about, like you say, to some extent about self-esteem, about things that we've perhaps not been brought up to yeah. be allowed to have our own boundaries and things like that. So I think we need to sort of try and realize that yes, actually people will respect you when you say, I'm not comfortable, I don't want to do that thing, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the saying no, which I know you're gonna talk about in a minute about how to do this, like how to put these boundaries in place. It is about, respect it's about you having your own autonomy and your own safety mm -hmm. and then knowing and understanding when you're uncomfortable that means you probably need a boundary to be put in place will help you like the awareness is the thing that i think is really big yeah. Yeah. being aware that when you're uncomfortable about something that probably means you need a boundary to to, to state that you have a boundary that needs to be put in place. And I think that's actually quite a difficult one for us. I think we're so uncomfortable a lot of the time that we just take it as the norm. So actually being aware is really big. That's why we've got the awareness there. I just wanna very quickly pick up on, again, because we're not gonna go into detail. Um, I pinned Jessica Jane's um, comment, which was that sometimes when adults say that a child has no boundaries, they really mean that a child has not complied with imposed rules. And I've pinned that, it, it leads into another parent on here who's very sadly has realized um, that their child has been 
experience grooming. And these are quite serious things about why actually we should be teaching not just us as adults, but children that they are allowed to say no, that yeah. they are allowed when they're uncomfortable to put in a boundary and teach them how to do that in the right way. Yeah. Because sadly, not putting in boundaries and protecting yourself and just complying because that means you're a good girl, you're a good boy, you're a good child. Actually, that's quite dangerous and can be very dangerous for you growing up and later in life. And um, the part of the video that I've got of um, talking to Nicola Wakeling, which we're going to uh, release next Saturday, is something fantastic she said to me, which is that she actually wants to teach her daughter non-compliance because of the things that she's seen. Her poor daughter has done these things, has said yes to things, been a people pleaser, you know, all these kinds of things that we've talked about, about why you will ignore your own boundary needs. Yeah. And she does not want that for her daughter. She wants her daughter to be able to be autonomous. And so she wants to teach her about not complying with adults. Yeah. <laughs> and I the think P that's amazing. The PDA -er in me absolutely loves that idea, naturally. You know, I think I could also um, wonder as to whether it could be phrased as teaching them to do what is right for them, you know. So non-compliance is not just saying no to everything, you know. Non-compliance is knowing when, knowing when cooperation is not, um, what, was the, what, what were we talking about earlier? Cooperation versus compliance. It's, it's understanding the, um, the difference between compliance and cooperation. Compliance suggests that the child is succumbing to the will of the adult, whereas cooperation uh, implies more of a joint endeavor. So non-compliance should not necessarily suggest the child says no to everything. It's helping the child to develop a robust and harmonious relationship with themselves built upon respect and built upon knowing when saying no is okay and they should not feel bad because of it. Cool. If you don't respect someone's boundaries, you don't respect that person. Absolutely. And this is where boundaries needs to be um, developed into a wider conversation, not just for autistic people to have, but for neurotypical people to have. I was using the example earlier about traditional parenting models, um, how perhaps um, uh, in my parents' generation, their parents may not have uh, respected their the privacy of their children as much and would have just uh, invited themselves into their bedrooms. Um, understanding how boundaries differ could prevent that kind of thing from happening because you invite yourself, we have to think about what it means to invite yourself into someone's world. So we could think about that in a very um, uh, conventional uh, way. So if I get too close to you when I'm speaking, um, in all likelihood, I could be invading your personal space, but perhaps it doesn't just mean that, for example. Um, so if someone uses something that belongs to me before they ask, I view it as a violation of my personal space because my belongings, and I like to have few belongings, not too many for this reason, I'm a minimalist, because I, I'm not good at when people are touching my belongings. You know, even if they have to just um, pick something up and move it, that generates quite a profound anxiety response in me. So I feel as though there is some kind of violation going on there. So a lot of people might try and justify it as, oh, but um, I only moved it. It's like, yeah, okay, this is where your idea of boundaries conflict with mine. So this is important to have in a wider context and not just uh, amongst autistic people. Oh. Before we skip, sorry, before we go to the next one. Oh, um, the other way? That's it, lovely. Um, yeah, I think that's I think that's lovely. I think that was you that wrote that. So that refusal is boundary asserting, not disobedience. So trying to reframe these things as well, so that your children and yeah. you as adults can have that autonomy and have that um just yeah, you have your own autonomy. Um, yeah. and I think something I'm actually wanting to pick up again with the counsellor is what do you do when your boundary clashes with another person's boundary? You know, and, and I don't have an answer for that, but it would be really interesting to find that out as well. Like I need to learn these things too. Yeah, okay. 
see, I'd be happy to have a think about that, you know, and unpack that. Mm. You both, it's, if you respect each other, you both desist immediately, I'd say, you know, if there, if, if, so if um, we have different sensory needs, you and I, we have different sensory profiles. If I'm doing something that is pleasing to me, but at your detriment, I have a moral obligation to desist immediately, I think. And it's not for me to say you're overreacting or making a big deal of nothing and that you are actually being selfish because I'm trying to have fun here. If you're a good enough friend, I need to acknowledge that uh, we both need to be, um, we both need to be benefiting from our time together and not just one and not the other. Uh, why are boundaries useful? They can protect us from doing things we don't want to do, getting into situations we're not comfortable with, becoming anxious, becoming overloaded and overwhelmed, being oversensitive, uh, feeling tired uh, and drained or exhausted, feeling stressed, feeling sad, unhappy or crying, feeling resentful, becoming angry, having panic attacks, becoming depressed, experiencing complete burnout. So it may provide it may yield, sorry, short term goals in the sense that you say yes to something, you commit to something, even though you know in your heart of hearts, uh, it is beyond your capability. So the immediate uh, gratification you receive is when you please someone, you, you immediately minimize the chances of any distress. So I could be in a group of NTs they're all, it's Friday, it's Saturday tonight, so we'll, we'll say it's Saturday. Um, I don't know why I'd be in this situation, but bear with me. I'm in a group of NTs and they say it's Saturday night, let's hit the town. You coming, Harry? Now, I want to say no, um, but I say yes anyway. So I'm aware of the fact that I'm actually kind of lying, but I say yes, because if I say no, I will be met with, oh, go on from absolutely everyone in the group. So it is safer to um, violate your boundaries initially. Um, but then as we can see, long-term, this has consequences. We distance ourselves from ourselves. Uh, we learn to hate ourselves. We learn to lose touch with ourselves and what we really want. Um, we just feel stressed, unhappy. Um, uh, our relationships become one-sided. Uh, we learn to serve our friendships. And there's no point being in a friendship if all you do is serve them whilst you're not being um, given anything in return. So this will lead to a very and, uh, ultimately shit existence. And I think that's, that's so important to get that across to myself as well, that you're completely right. If you're saying yes and you know breaking your own boundaries and things like that because of the short-term benefit as it were or the short-term you know avoidance of being punished as it were for not saying yes mm. I think we do we need to have that time to think about and weigh up the benefits of our boundaries because the short-term appeasing that other person or per yeah. people could lead to this massive long list of punishments for you, like of, of yeah, which is huge. Massive. Okay, so boundaries can give you processing time, thinking time, time to decide what you really want to do, help you to stay within your limits, confidence, knowledge and what is happening. Yeah, confidence because as soon as you put boundaries in place, you're doing something very kind to yourself. You're being yourself, and the more you can be yourself, the stronger you yourself become. Um, and they always say it, don't they? It's usually in cheesy films as well, that, you know, the yes men don't get promoted. It's the ones that say, no, I've got something, I can't stay late tonight, yeah. or, you know, that kind of thing. They're the ones that other people character. respect because you respect yourself. Yeah, it shows strength of character, absolutely. Right, how to have boundaries. Respect yourself by giving yourself time, giving yourself permission, understanding what you want, taking note of how you feel, knowing your limits, understanding why boundaries are good for you. Um, so knowing your limits is interesting because maybe occasionally um, you know yourself well enough to um, 
step beyond your comfort zone. That could be important sometimes because perhaps um, you don't necessarily have a boundary to call upon in certain situations. Maybe it's new. Maybe the idea of this idea, the idea of this new activity doesn't pose significant threat. By which, if you know yourself well enough, um, perhaps you're, perhaps occasionally you can try uh, and do new things on the basis you do understand what your limits are. Um, yeah, give yourself time, give yourself permission. What, what, um, what did the counsellor mean again by giving yourself time when you do boundaries? I was, I was just thinking that. I was thinking maybe it's something to do with when you're... Um, oh, so, oh, right, I, I got it, I remember it. So it was, um, maybe you don't have to give someone an answer straight away. Give yourself time to ponder on it uh, within the comfort and sanctity of your own mind. Uh, give yourself permission to do that and really get a feel objectively of what you want as opposed to defaulting to I don't matter other people do and, um, and that was that was really interesting because she did ask me I, I we were giving obviously examples to the counsellor so that we could work on where we've struggled with boundaries and things like that and for examples um to then have these things apply to mm -hmm. um, and I gave an example of a friendship that that really fell apart because I was very much being taken advantage of and my boundaries were absolutely being squashed. And I actually tried very hard to state my boundaries quite clearly. And what was really interesting was the counsellor saying to me, you know, what did you want from that friendship, for instance, or and did you get what you wanted from that friendship? And if you're not, if you're, if you're, I mean, if you go back to your example, which was, you know, lads night out, which again, I don't know how you would end up in that situation. Um, I used to all the time, actually, but I yeah. was drinking very heavily back then. So, so somebody asks you or says, come on, we're going out. And, and you say, let me just think about that a second. Yeah. And then really investigate what you want. Do you actually want to go out? And do you want to get drunk? Do you want to get exhausted? Do you want to wake up, wake up with a hangover the next day and be sensory bombarded in a really yeah, yeah. crowded pub? Or Sounds very sensitive. actually, I want to just go home and get a takeaway and watch that series that I've been watching that I love. And I know I'll be happy in, in that sort of yeah. space yeah. and I think yeah so I think that was really key when when she asked me that you know what do you actually want from those situations yeah because we understand that we for me what's important in drawing boundaries is understanding what I'm being led by you know which uh, feelings am I acting on you know what am I being drawn to and I you know I, you're probably not going to give uh, this example, but you're a very generous person. You know, you are uh, easily one of the most generous people I've ever met. And you do have this kind of open, I'm here to help you aura to you. And that is, that can only be a beautiful thing. Um, and, but in doing so, you open yourself up to people who need help, and that's wonderful, although that can reach its limits quite quickly, you know, because um, this is where the problem comes in. There are certain individuals who will wiggle their way in, who are very toxic, and will notice this open, generous quality and feed off of it. And that's where uh, p having personal boundaries comes in handy because the personal boundaries can serve to regulate and, um, and balance yourself in the sense that uh, having those attributes is beautiful and important for the community, but people uh, who are toxic can, uh, as I said, wiggle their way in, grab hold of that quality and start preying on it and start uh, feeding off of it. Um, and so that's it what can the counsellor said, wasn't it? Is, yeah. is then they start to like just misshapen your boundaries, like bit right, by yeah. bit by bit. Wonkify them. And then if I, and, and, and like I say, this was so key for me because when she's saying that and she's like, but if you maintain your boundaries the whole time, you're less likely to become exhausted or less likely to 
yeah reach burnout. lose the ability to actually support continue to support people and things like this yeah. so we, this, like I said, this has been such a good session. Yeah, because it's um, it's an example of like we said before, it's not self. It's because I think people, when they are like that, when they have that tendency to, when they're driven by their need to help, uh, they can't help but feel as though they are being selfish. If they are, uh, if their uh, drive is to help others and be of service to others, then such a person may be more likely to forego drawing boundaries. And when the idea occurs to them that perhaps boundaries are a good idea right now because I am experiencing problems with other people who are taking advantage, then it can be very hard not to see that as selfishness, but it is an act of self-respect. It is knowing that, oh, I can work more efficiently if I you know, lock the gate occasionally. Uh, because that gives me more spoons, time and energy to help the people who are in, in dire need of it. So it's understanding boundaries and developing self, uh, understanding um, a balance and developing self-respect. And I think that, yeah, understanding why the boundaries are good for you. I could literally do a little spider diagram off of yeah. that one thing. And like yeah. I say, it means I can continue to support people. I can continue to have, uh, you know, better well-being for myself not get so exhausted all this kind of thing so i can see why i have to be more assertive in my boundaries absolutely absolutely um i'm trying to it's something i've had to learn you know since um doing a lot of work in this field because i started from i started from nothing in this field you know i was just a guy on youtube i just made i went from hitchhiking around to making youtube videos and initially, I permitted a lot of people to add me on Facebook, right? Um, and I didn't think anything of it until my following began growing quite precipitously. And then by this point, I realized, oh my goodness gracious me, I'm becoming overwhelmed very quickly. And people who are, who are and I, I took responsibility for the fact I said, yeah, sure, whatever, you can add me on Facebook, because I thought it would just be about 10 or 15, but oh my goodness, I, got, I became overwhelmed very quickly and people were asking a lot of questions and perhaps occasionally I'd be in situations where I might have um, snapped at some people, which was then held against me. You know, they kind of took my uh, uh, anger out of context and used it to kind of discredit me because it's like, oh, look, look at the way Harry's reacting. It's like, look, <laughs> it was a combination of, yes, I didn't have, I made a foolish mistake allowing people to, people on mass to add me. And also I'm being preyed upon by people who were taking advantage. So, that fact, yeah. you know, it, for me nowadays, it's been so important, you know, um, employing a PA, for example, and um, knowing who my friends are and who my clients are. And, um, not actually reaching out for people anymore you know like not doing not doing that at all you know i've got my friend group and i love my friends and the idea of having a huge friend group is very daunting it's like no because what happens is you do realize people can be hard to trust because when you're connecting with so many people all the time you see humanity in many different uh shades many different shapes and forms so it's so important drawing boundaries and I'm very grateful for the education we've had and that days. goes on with um, Amanda's comment which is when you start putting boundaries in place you start getting people not liking this change of behavior the ones that start disliking it will test you right. and I think that's also quite important that if you put boundaries in place and people don't like it that might be a really good indicator that they don't actually have respect for you as a person yeah this could winnow out the people who aren't really meant to be your friend as brutal as that sounds because if they can't respect who you are at your core self-respecting and sturdy in your principles then perhaps they're not the right person for you perhaps they liked it more when you were fawning over them when you were putting your true self aside in favor of being the person they wanted to be. So you probably 
it's probably a radical identity shift that takes place. Um, and, and I ended up, you know, ending a friendship because my boundary was crossed in the sense of I need plans. The way my brain works, I need plans. Harry knows this. And while Harry's a very spontaneous, quite impulsive person, you respect my my need for planning. Yeah. And, and I want to. It's, it doesn't come naturally to me, but because you're a friend, I want to make sure you're okay. And, and actually you you work at that. So it's not, you know, I can and I can see that that you're trying to respect yeah. my boundary. Yeah. Whereas this other person, even though I'd known them a long time, kept pushing that and pushing that to the point that I was in tears on a motorway um, because they weren't giving me a plan for something that was supposed yeah. to be happening. And I was like, actually, do you know what? You, if you don't respect me enough to give me something that doesn't actually take that much away in terms of energy for you, yeah. this, is not, this is not reciprocal. This is not respected. That's where it gets action. difficult because people who have very profound needs are more likely to voluntarily break your boundaries down and such a person would be extremely difficult to be friends with um okay so number six how to set a boundary uh, clearly identify oh hang on i'm moving the zoom bar again it keeps getting in the way clearly identify the boundary you want to set be direct don't make excuses don't be sorry use the three c's be calm clear and consistent when you set a boundary be assertive no thank you not aggressive fuck off Remove the emotion, not the same as being heartless. So these are very important things to bear in mind, especially if you are yourself autistic, uh, because we do little, we were having a very interesting conversation with this uh, counselor and I was uh, using an example um, of a situation I was in recently. Um, a person who was inquiring about w uh, working uh, for Academy and what they had to offer right now is not needed by us. So I was using language that was intended to minimize their hurt as opposed to being completely um, direct. And it's really difficult because I often find myself not getting that sweet spot right. I'm either, I think I'm either too assertive and too aggressive or I'm too polite. I can't find that happy medium um, because I can be quite, you know, half the reason I, well, not half the reason, but part, partly why I like having a PA is because I don't trust my natural uh, reactions to people who um, uh, approach me on Facebook. You know, I can get, I'm very, I can be very intolerant and very snappy with people. Um, so I don't, you know, I, I don't want to, my politeness is I don't even want to put anyone in that position. If I, if they say something and I'm like, you know, but in the same breath, sometimes we can overdo it. We can sugarcoat it too much. So um, we can say things. I, I, I said something like, Oh, we're not really looking for that right now. I didn't have to say um, really. And that's what the counselor said. They said, why did you say really? I'm like, I don't know, actually. I think what was it's interesting in that conversation is you were saying, yeah, well, I was, I was assertive and I said this. And then she said, repeat it again. And you repeated it. And she was like, that wasn't clear and concise. Yeah, that's how it went, yeah, yeah. You know, it was really, and, and it does, it makes you investigate what you're saying. And I love direct language. You know, I find it much more useful. On my emails, it says, I will... Um, usually be direct and to the point because people tend to think I'm being rude because I don't do yeah. the whole hi hey, how are you because it, it's, it's a bit meaningless but yeah. we do this don't we when we're so worried about upsetting the other person but actually they were already encroaching on our boundaries and I think what's quite important as well is you've got six sort of key ideas and things linked here Sometimes I think we really need to investigate that first one. Yeah. You know, what boundary do you actually sure. need to set? Do that, and I find that's actually quite key. Sit with that idea. Am I uncomfortable right now? Why am I uncomfortable? Or I actually don't want to do that thing. You know, really start to investigate that so that then you can be direct and say, 
I don't know. Um, well, it's um, the, the councillor all also introduced us to the importance of saying need rather than want, because want becomes personal. Like, I do not want this. It means that I, as a human being, do not accept what you have to offer, whereas the need would imply what the, uh, what the company, what the business, uh, what our work requires. So because if I'm speaking to someone and they're being very blunt, I can, I'm very likely to challenge their bluntness. I'm very likely to follow it up with, excuse me, robot, you know, have some bloody emotion, damn it. But that's me personally. Um, it's very, I find it very difficult to bear all of these things in mind because let's say I apply for something um, and it's unsuccessful. I'm not saying, I, I don't want them to be gushing. I don't want them to kiss my ass. I don't want, the, want them to sugarcoat it. But if they're completely tactless, I think it reflects badly on them. I think um, if people are applying to contribute to Academy, I think we do have a moral obligation to have some tact and we can still be assertive at the same time. We're very clear. We do not need this right now, but thank you for your interest. You know, like I think that's okay. I think, um, I think it could reflect badly if we are quite a little too robotic and forthright in the way we deal with uh, people who are quite frankly, no use to us. And I think particularly when, if people are trying to support their children to be assertive and putting boundaries from themselves, I think those last two are really important to teach or help children to learn is that, because like you said, I know why adults, teachers, etc. they they'll just see it as the child being defiant because the child child will, I don't know, swear and run off or something like that. And it might just be the case that they just haven't been taught or haven't learnt to just calmly state, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that thing. You know, you know, it, and, and be clear in why they don't want to do that thing as well. I think it's about learning these things. And then when we become adults, you know, because I haven't learned these, th these things. So I think we do need to start with the children as well to help them. Of course. You know, why are you... Very, yeah. You might, and, and they might not be able to particularly at, at whatever stage they are in the development articulate why they don't want to do the thing. Yeah. You know, so I think trying to investigate those things with children yeah. is actually quite useful. This and then, yeah, doing the, you know, no, thank you. I don't need your help dressing me kind of thing as opposed to f off and like getting really funny and, yeah. and putting your emotion into it i think this this idea of trying to detach yourself a little bit from the emotion is quite useful because the f off could be coming from a place of i don't want to have to say f off so i'm saying it very abruptly and loudly to to def to, to get myself out of this horrible situation of saying no you know it should be okay to say no um we we aren't beholden to everyone Okay, seven, useful strategies, Harry's favorite word, because <laughs> me giving strategies is unheard of. Ask for thinking time, have a stock phrase ready for any eventuality. I'll get back to you on that. And so this is, this is where the importance of time came in. I will let you know later, I need time to think. I can't answer right now, but I will get back to you later, which is absolutely fair enough. And like I said, if a person is pressuring you to, make a specific decision, it's probably wise to rethink our friend group. Or just, I'll check my calendar. Yeah. Just say no. You may find it easier if you change your mind to say yes later. I it's found that interesting. Yeah, because that's, that's happened. So, because my natural inclination is to say no to most things. And I often find myself doing that. No, then I get that out of the way. And then it, what, what it does is, if I say it forcefully enough, the group will have to accept my no. And because they've accepted my no, they stop pressuring me. And then it gives me time to actually consider what I really want to do, right? 
So sometimes it's useful just to say no in the moment. And then I go away and think, ah, oh, but perhaps it could be a good idea. You know, and then it becomes my decision and it's different. It's I say yes on the basis I choose to, as opposed to because I'm being compelled to. And I liked that. So she was explaining that obviously if you say yes and then change your mind and say no later, once you've actually thought about it, that will be received quite negatively. Whereas if you say no in the first instance and then change your mind later, you're actually, you've, you've not let someone down in their eyes anyway. Yes. So yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Just immediately say no, it's right. great. Be prepared, practice scenarios that you might need to use a boundary in and rehearse your strategy. Um, that's interesting. So like- What was her suggestion? Play. Wasn't it to, oh, that was it. Was it, oh, has she got them on here? Was it like the canvases and stuff? Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, whoops, where's it gone? Practice saying no uh, when it's not so important to you. For example, next time a street canvasser tries to stop you. Oh, that's what you meant. <laughs> yeah. Or a salesman telephones you trying to send. <laughs> I'm laughing because I know how I deal with these imbeciles. Um, trying to sell you something, say no and say fuck off and repeat fuck off until they stop asking. Note how it felt. Oh, wow. I feel satisfied that it's not even happened. Yeah, I loved it though, because she was saying, yeah, usually when we get like, um, you know, um, someone trying to sell you something on the phone or something like that, I will, I'll probably just hang up or I'll swear or something like that, yeah. but it's not gonna cost you anything emotionally or anything like that to just say no. And then they'll yeah, ask get... again, no. I won't, go into, I won't go into detail, but my go-to reaction for salespeople on the phone is to pressure them for phone sex. I just start talking really dirty to them until they put the phone down. Because I think, no, I'm not going to be the one who puts the phone down. You are. I'm just going to be clear. The counsellor's suggestion for everybody who's watching is to just say no. <laughs> not, not, not Harry's suggestion. <laughs> just don't take my advice. It's not worth it. Um, thank you for your contribution. We don't need further contributions now. Uh, we wish you well. If we need anything in the future, we'll get in touch with you. See, my, my inner Loki is feeling mischievous now. But yeah, I'm keeping shtum. Boundary tips. Think ahead for potential situations where you might need a boundary. Be consistent. Uh, people know what to expect. Then uh, use the same boundary for the same purpose each time if you can. Ask what someone expects of you so you know where their boundaries are. Write your feelings, thoughts, processes down. Sometimes writing it down gets it out of your head and you will look back at your thoughts about it much more clearly. Keep a diary of how each situation that involved a boundary made you feel and how you reacted and what the outcome was. This will enable you to identify triggers that impede your boundary making skills. For example, if someone asks for something in a crowded place, does it impede your ability to set a boundary? View the outcome as it actually is, rather than what your anxiety tells you it was or will be next time. For example, your anxiety might tell you that the other person was peeved at you for setting a boundary, but the reality was that their tone of voice remained kind and they said goodbye to you later. So perhaps they weren't as peeved as your anxiety thoughts told you and i yeah this they're all great it's all just really really useful i like to say this is only the second time I, i'm going through this which is why harry was being the teacher today because i was like i need to really get this to be absorbed professor harry dr chloe <laughs> people in healthy two-way relationships or friendships respect each other's boundaries without question. And we spoke about that earlier, didn't we? Um, and, and I've said this, I've always done this anyway, because um, I am quite good at sort of identifying boundaries and putting them in place, but sometimes it does, they do get wonky because people will push them. And sadly I would have let them. Um, but when it comes to other people's boundaries, and I, I never need anything from somebody. If somebody says no to me, I don't need to know why. I don't need to know the reasons. You know, 
I will respect that that person said no. And I used to have students um, who would, you know, email me and say that they weren't coming to a class. For me, that's enough. They don't need to tell me why. None of my business. They're all adults. If they're not yeah. coming, they're not coming. It's respectful that they let me know because actually that's what that was one of my boundaries at the time because I was teaching an access course it was a very small course and if a number of them weren't there I would have driven for 40 minutes with but, no student yeah. there. I mean I, then they would yeah but then they would give me all this detail about why they weren't right. coming and right. I would say to them I don't need that I sure. respect you telling me you can't come don't need any more than that okay so that's that's you and I completely get that. See, I'm the type of person, I don't, sometimes I do not respond well to sudden change. And I'm very aware that uh, it could, uh, it could impact upon personal relationships I have. Um, now, there, this kind of ties into how can you have um, a, a well boundaried I'll be a, um, you know, pleasant and respectful relationship with an autistic person. So like with you, like we've said before, um, sometimes I'll have to curtail some of my impulses due to your visual mind, right? See, and I'm, I'm the kind of person, if someone has to change something last minute, I will need kind, some kind of support through that. You know, I will kind of expect uh, a friend or whoever it is to um, explain why, you know, in a specific way, so as to minimize, because if they, if they just change it and don't tell me anything, I'd find it very hard to cope with that kind of situation. Um, but then I think I would do that, wouldn't I? Because then that is me respecting your Yeah, name. of course. And I'd still be, but then it, I'm not, this is not nearly as bad as I used to be when I was younger. You know, like if someone changed the plans on me last minute when I was little, I would go ballistic. And these days, what I do is I, I have many, if I'm planning one thing, I usually make backup plans. So I have things that are equally exciting to fall back on should plan a fail. So that's for me to do, but you know, I still kind of think, all right, so the cooperation I'd require from my friend is to detail what, what what's going on in there. So I can be led by my empathy and not by my anger that the plan is changing, if that makes sense. So if you, if, if we plan something and a day, the night before you say, oh my gosh, something huge has come up. If you tell me what has come up, I can plug in to uh, your, the reason why you're prioritizing that. And then from there, I can make an informed decision to you know, step back. Otherwise, I'll be led by my need to cement the plans in place. Um, or you know, um, using precise language, you know, like understanding that, okay, I'll, you know, knowing when a person is going to call, for example, knowing when things are gonna happen, you know, um so so you've got good with your with my boundary thing which is so again this is about identifying when you actually have a need and then that is probably a boundary yeah. that you would want to put in place so i get very very anxious with surprise telephone calls mm. and i will just look at my phone with anxiety that it's ringing and it's not right. because i don't necessarily want to talk to the person yeah it's quite hard to explain but I, there's a there's a number of autistic people really don't like telephone calls in general yeah so and harry you would typically like to just call i just call I, completely uh, spontaneous you yeah know, i don't plan calls i just i i like so if i'm calling you i'll probably finish something I'll probably finish doing something. I'll, I'll finish a consultation. I'll finish reading a chapter and I might think, oh, I've got um, 20 minutes. Oh, I'll give Chloe a call. And my in impulse is to literally from thought to calling you that, that that could take about three seconds. But you've got, but you have got better at, for instance, going, can I, can we zoom? Yeah. Or, or I'll just send you a zoom link instead. I yeah. often do that. And then I'll do something else alongside. So I could be doing something and I'm like, oh, I'll just send a zoom link. Maybe she'll pick it up. So from my end, um, I need, if I'm, if we're organizing a phone call, like I need you, I'd need you to be clear as to when it could happen. If it's not happening right now, you know, so you could say something like, I'll call soon. Um, 
and then maybe you d you don't call for another hour and then i'm like what does soon mean um and then you keep on saying oh oh yeah you know i'm just finishing this like i don't for me it's not that it has to the phone call doesn't have to be right now if you said at midnight which is in um uh, three hours time that's cool it means that I've got three hours to do other things I can occupy myself for three hours but when I'm literally um, unsure as to when the phone call is taking place because you've said soon and it's like one and a half hours nothing can get done in one and a half hours because my brain will be stuck on your calling soon you know so that's a example of how communication is so important when it comes to sustaining relationships and I think it's interesting because I've I've always kind of taken the ideas of boundaries very literally, which is quite obvious, obvious thing to do when you're autistic and you take everything quite literally. But the things that that would that some people might class as quite small things. So your need for specificity when it comes to knowing if somebody's going to call you or something yeah. along those lines, my need for somebody to let me know in a text or something ahead of calling me. Right for instance, I would never have classed those as boundaries, like putting in, but but this is why this has been so useful, trying to understand that actually those are needs that I have, those are needs that you have. Yeah, exactly. And that means that we're putting in yeah. rules. I want were. to know, yeah. See, I, I want to know um, what people's limits are, like, because I am aware of a certain degree of clumsiness that I have. I'm aware that I can easily hurt people without intending to. So when people are clear in their communication and they tell me what is off limits and, you know, I, it's, it helps me and it helps them too, because otherwise I could be consistently getting little things wrong and then learning the hard way, you know? So for me, it's important that I know, uh, you know, there are certain topics that are off limited such that it gives you these images in your mind that are very vivid or you know the, the calling thing you know I could easily just say oh you know I just I spontaneously call that's what I do but no this gives me an opportunity to um, ensure our friendship continues to be respectful and this is where boundaries come in place and you know so my thing you know like I need people to be precise are they calling soon if, if you say you know I need when wh what does that mean if you said I'm, I'll call you in three hours Fantastic. That gives me three hours to do, uh, to write this, to, to, to go for a run, to meditate, to, to read something, you know. So these things are important to know um, because that can help us reconcile, you know, our different autistic experiences. And it works really well. At no point do we ever feel like we're making too many compromises. It, it works based on good communication and respect for each other's boundaries. And, and this last point, which is that obviously someone that constantly ignores your boundaries or persuades you to do what they want. So to, you know, to squash your own boundaries is not necessarily somebody who's healthy for you. Hmm. And again, this was huge because this counsellor basically helped me take away some of the guilt for ending a very, very harmful relationship with somebody who was constantly constantly pushing my boundaries and making me feel like my boundaries weren't important and that they were selfish and things like this and so talking to this counselor I you know I went into detail and they said no that wasn't right and how do you feel now and actually I feel better because now I'm not having my boundaries and I'm not being un made to feel uncomfortable constantly by somebody who couldn't respect my boundaries yeah. so that was that was really big just for somebody to say to me no that was the right thing to do somebody's was, yeah somebody's crushing your boundaries you end that relationship yeah if they're if they're crushing your boundaries that much they either don't know you very well at all or they don't like you very well at all you know it boils down to that okay and that is it like I say, this has been so, I've said it multiple times, I know, but this has been so huge for us, um, both, I think. And like I say, there's so many other things that I, I feel we're going to go back to this, this fantastic counsellor and, and ask about other things relating to this, to, relating to boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, 
but we're going to be practicing it ourselves because yeah. you know, it is hard. And I was um, I was curious as to how this uh, discussion would pan out because I thought, oh, this is slightly different to the kind of things we usually do. And now we've reached the end of today's discussion. I'm really pleased we did it because I've learned a lot. Um, I've also realized, um, like you said about kind of having the validation, you know, that, oh, what I did was the right thing because I can recall um, last year having to put a number of boundaries in place following quite a traumatic experience. Um, and I felt kind of bad about it at the time. And through learning about boundaries through this counsellor, I feel validated as well. So I'm happy to pass this information on. So all, all credit goes to that uh, counsellor. Um, I just want to very quickly, as we're ending, pick up on um, Kirsty's point. I think that that might be something, again, within potential subtopics of this bigger topic. Like I say, there were so many things to do with boundaries that we didn't even get to cover with the counsellor because it's such a, a, a big a big area um so what Kirsty's asked is what if your child who isn't able to respect your boundaries as a parent oh i've lost it hold on yeah i'm trying to find it myself i've got I'll it here it. um it. how do you respect yourself teach them about boundaries by modeling them yet still hold up your own boundaries <laughs> and this is exactly what i'm this is something i actually want to go back to this counselor and ask which is exactly that what happens when your boundaries and somebody you care about's boundaries aren't, they don't fit together. Mm. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I can't answer that for you. So that is going to be something I think I need to ask yeah. the counsellor. I mean, that's something we can come back to. Uh, the answer, like we could sit and think about what the answer could be, but it's, it would take a long time. We're out of spoons at this point, but we can, uh, we can guarantee we will probably return to that question because it's very important. Yeah. Cool. Been good. Okay. Uh, um, thank you everybody so much. Um, so obviously we always have at the bottom at the moment of our um, lives and things like that, a little button about donating a pound if you're able. Um, we are so grateful for the people that have been doing that because it's meant that we've been able to pay our speakers who come on. And I know that might sound like, well, that's why we gave the money, but it's so, it's such a normal practice within lots of organizations to not pay autistic speakers. And so for Harry and I, it has been really important for us to be able to do that, to actually have really amazing speakers come on um, and then actually be able to pay them for their time. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you've been able to help us do that. Um, at some point, we'd love to be self-sufficient and never need a single penny from any of you. We would just carry on educating because that's really what we want to do. Um, but my point being that, yeah, if you can donate just one pound, we really don't want lots from anybody. We want to make it really accessible. It means that we'll be able to pay the amazing counsellor who supported us to do this talk today. Um, if you can't really, that is absolutely fine. Just keep watching and sharing and learning um, because that's really what Harry and I are so, so excited to have been able to do with Academy so far. I'm all happy about Academy at the moment. <laughs> <sighs> so thank you everyone, Chloe. Thank you as usual. Um, oh no, goodbyes, Forma formalities. Oh no, away. oh no, we're running away, yeah, okay. That's the thing, I, we were so, I was so professional right up until that, actually no, I had, I had my moments when I talked about phone sex, but <laughs> all to the point, I don't, I, I don't know how to do a goodbye. It's goodbye from him. <laughs> and Freddie. Okay, Freddie Mercury, who is amazing, look at those teeth. They make me so happy. This is such a random ending. Okay, bye everybody, I'm stopping the live. <laughs>